Okay, so finally we need to talk about some of the concerns and the pitfalls that you might come across when you're working with regression discontinuity design. Um, the main one, the biggest problem that you'll run into is of statistical power. Um, you need a ton of data to do this type of regression discontinuity analysis because you're throwing most of it away. Um, so if you look at this, uh, again, this is from the previous section um, showing different bandwidths. Um, if you have a bandwidth of 5 in this case, you're throwing away like half your data. If you have a bandwidth of 2.5 here, you're only keeping these orange points and you're throwing all of this other stuff away. Um, and so if you don't have a ton of observations and you're throwing like 80% of them away, that's going to be really hard to measure any statistical, statistically significant gap between um, the lines on either side of that cut point. And it's going to be hard to measure any sort of causal effect. So you need a lot of data for this. Um, also, the gap that you're measuring is limited to just the people in the bandwidth. Um, we mentioned this before in the very first section um, of the lecture here, this local average treatment effect. What you're calculating is not the global population level average treatment effect. You're not saying that participating in this tutoring program boosts test scores for everybody by 11 points. What you're saying is people who score around 70 on the entrance exam will have their final test scores boosted by 11 points on average. That's the causal effect for just that bandwidth. Um, so that is why it is a local average treatment effect. And this is important because you can't make population level claims with a local average treatment effect. Or if you do, you just have to be like super confident about it and make a really good argument for it. Um, and rule out any other things that might be different from um, kind of the between the, the, the group around the bandwidth or around the cutoff and the people who aren't. Um, like in the case of the time zone paper that we looked at with the voting patterns, um, people who live right on the border of Georgia and Alabama, that's a time zone marker. Um, they're probably very similar to people who live in the middle of Texas, which doesn't have a time zone marker. So that's probably more generalizable, that finding, even though it's a local average treatment effect. But with a test score where the running variable is measuring people kind of with different abilities of taking tests, you can't really compare the 40 point people with the 100 point people. And so your treatment effect in that case is just that bandwidth. It's not kind of generalizable to everybody. Um, so lots of people who are anti-regression discontinuity um, will bring this up a lot and they'll say everything you're finding is just for this very narrow section of the population, which sure, that is true. Um, you're finding local average treatment effects. But also, um, even though randomized controlled trials and diff and diff um, arguably generate average treatment effects for an entire population, um, in practice, that's still kind of a local effect. Um, if you run a randomized controlled trial, um, you're not doing it on a whole segment or a whole sample of the population. It's generally like volunteers who like to take studies or who like to participate in studies. They might be weird. Um, you have all sorts of um, external or external validity issues that you have to worry about and generalizability. And so that kind of messes up with the whole universal average treatment effect that you find with an RCT. With diff and diff too, um, every diff and diff you have this treatment and control group that are very similar, like New Jersey and Pennsylvania are very, very similar and you found a causal effect there. But does that same causal effect apply to Alaska or Montana? I don't know. Um, and so you still like diff and diff arguably gives you a population level average treatment effect, but it's still kind of localized. Um, and so Engrist and Pischke, they wrote your um, Mastering Metrics book, their first book, which is more technical, but still really helpful and accessible. It's called Mostly Harmless Econometrics. Um, in that book, they make this argument here that all quantitative empirical results that we encounter, whether it be through RCTs or diff and diff or regression discontinuity or regression with DAGs that tell you what to adjust for with inverse probability weighting, everything we're doing is still essentially local. Um, the only way it's going to be a global population level effect is if we have perfect external validity which is rarely the case. And so don't let the fact that regression discontinuity only shows you a local average treatment effect, um, don't, don't let that scare you away because everything is essentially a local average treatment effect in the end. Um, 
with regards to this continuity, it's just more specifically local. It's just the people in your bandwidth. Um, but it's every everything is local in the end. So don't let this dissuade you. Um, another issue. The graphical element or the graphical aspect of regression discontinuity is super cool. Um, I teach data visualization. I'm a very visual person, um, minored in graphic design. That's partially why I love this stuff um, versus like diff and diff where you just have weird interaction terms and stuff. Regression discontinuity is very, very visual and people get it um, very easily um, when you show them graphs because if you look at something like this, there's definitely a gap there and that's super exciting. There's maybe a gap here. There's maybe, a, I don't know if there's a gap there. So if you look at this, for instance, you have these three different plots. Um, which of these are statistically significant? Um, one issue with um, relying solely on graphical inference here is that you will underestimate effects. Um, this gap here for panel A, definitely significant. For panel B, maybe. Panel C, those look like that's not a huge gap. There's probably overlap with the confidence intervals. And so we could probably, if you just look at this, you would probably say that's not a gap. We can ignore that. There's no causal effect of the program. But that's dangerous because when you actually calculate the statistics, all of these are statistically significant. All of them have a big gap. So here there's a gap of 63 units from down here, like zero up to 63-ish. Um, the the p-value is tiny, and so that is statistically significant, definitely not zero in a world where it might be zero. Um, if you look at this panel, there is some overlap. It looks like there might be, um, but the p-value is still pretty significant and small, which means seeing this in a world where there is no effect um, is pretty rare. So we can be fairly confident that that's not zero. Even here, this gap is only 8.8. .8. That's a small gap, but look at the p-value. It's 0.04, which is less than 0.05. And so this is still fairly rare to see in a world where there is no difference, um, which means it's statistically significant. So if you only rely on graphical inference and you just look at these, you would say A is definitely good, B is maybe good, C, throw that away. Who cares about that program? It's not doing anything. Um, but C is doing stuff that is statistically significant. So don't just rely on graphics. Um, in practice, it's actually pretty rare to see very, very huge, clear breaks um, in your outcome variable across your running variable. That's not a very common thing to have happen. Um, and so use graphs. Graphs are great. That's the whole point of doing regression discontinuity. You make pretty pictures. But don't only rely on the graphs. Um, Find the actual delta value, that actual difference there, um, and measure how statistically significant it is and do all of the summary statistics for it and do um, everything else you can to see how robust of a difference that is. It might not be graphically apparent, but there is really a gap there. So don't over rely on graphics. Um, a couple other things to worry about is this idea of manipulation, um, where if people know about the cutoff, which is very often the case, um, especially for like social services um, or test scores. Um, if you know about the cutoff, you're more likely to change your behavior so that you can get into the program or out of the program. Um, and so if people are manipulating their way in and out of the program, um, then that ruins your, your inference. Um, your, the whole intuition is that the people on either side of the cutoff are very, very similar. It's just kind of random chance that one of them got the program and one didn't. But if one group is purposely kind of trying to get, like with this tutoring thing, um, everybody knows that if you get 70 um, or lower, you get the tutoring. Um, if you know you're going to get like a 90 or 100, then you'll do that. But if you know that generally you're like a C student, um, you might purposely do bad so that you can get the tutor. And then later you'll do better because you have the tutor and you would have gotten like a 75 or an 80, but you purposely bombed the test to get a tutor, which then means which then means that you're not very comparable to the people who got like a 68 and would have gotten a 68 without like totally bombing it. Um, and so that ruins the inference here. This happens all the time when people know about thresholds, even if it's um, 
a, even if it doesn't like qualify you for specific things. Um, there's this really cool plot here of 9.5 million marathon finishing times. Basically every marathoner um, for like the past few decades in the United States for like major marathons. Um, what's cool is this shows the histogram of finishing times. And if you notice these thin lines here are finishing times at three hours, three and a half hours, four hours, four hours and 30 minutes. And if you look, right around each of those kind of logical timings, like four hours or four hours and 30 minutes, there's a huge peak because um, these people here are trying as fast as they can to hit the three hour mark. And so there are a ton of people who finish at like two hours and 59 minutes. And there are very few people relative to that other, like the people who rushed to finish at three hours and one minute. Um, because if you were going to finish at three hours and one minute, you'll just push yourself so that you can finish two minutes earlier and get under the three hour mark. Um, you see that all over the place with each of these um, white marks here. The biggest one is the four hour mark. People really love to finish under four hours. And so because of that, if you were doing some sort of regression discontinuity thing, the people on this side of the four hour mark um, are kind of comparable to the people on this this side of the four hour mark, the 405 versus the 355. But lots of the 355 people probably would have been on the four hour, like on this side of the four hour mark if there were no clocks. I um, mean, if they didn't have a watch because then they wouldn't purposely push themselves to finish under the cutoff. Um, and so it doesn't really work for kind of that core intuition behind the inference of having comparable treatment and control groups because it's no longer random. This happens in other sports too. Um, so if you look at this, this, is, this shows um, every shot taken um, by NBA players in 2014 to 2015. Um, and if you notice around the three point line, there are tons of people taking shots from there. Um, but then nobody's taking any shots from like a couple inches inside the three point line. And that's because it's a, it's a harder shot, it's further away, but you only get two points for doing it. And so if you're going to shoot from far away, you might as well just like take a step back um, and get the extra point if you make it because the distance is basically the same. Um, and so people know about this threshold and they change their behavior around the threshold. Um, and so you, if, you, if this was like a regression discontinuity thing, people shooting from this side, you can't really compare them to people shooting from this side. Um, because they're not, it's not random chance. They know about the cutoff and they're manipulating um, which side of the cutoff they're on. Um, you can check for manipulation um, using something called a McCrary density test, where you basically do a density plot um, for people on one side of the running variable and then compare that to a density plot on the other side of the running variable um, or a histogram, same idea. And if you see a weird gap here in the density, that means that people are probably manipulating it. There are more people on this side of the running variable than should be. Um, if you're in a world of no manipulation, there shouldn't be a gap here. It just means like it's kind of the smooth thing. Some people are on this side, some people are on that side, but there's not a huge difference. If you come to here, these people know about it and they're purposely getting under the running variable. And so then there's a sudden gap there. And if you have that gap there, that means you likely have some sort of manipulation where lots of these people would have been on this side, but they did something to get themselves to the other side. Um, and then that messes up your ability to make inferences and whatever gap you measure is probably gonna be wrong. Um, so it's a good idea to check for manipulation before you start measuring gaps. Um, you also finally have this idea called non-compliance um, where you might have people on the margin of the cutoff, um, so somebody might score a 71 and get a tutor, or somebody might score a 69 and not get a tutor um, because either they don't want one or because of um, bureaucratic mess up, um, they misreported the test score or something, or the tutor didn't show up, or there's something that messes up the actual application, um, the actual implementation of the program. Um, you see this, especially with like um, the Affordable Care Act and this whole subsidy idea that we talked about in the very first section of this lecture. Um, if you're in a state that does not, that did not expand Medicaid in the wake of the Affordable Care Act, you're in this weird zone where if you earn like 110% of the poverty line, you don't qualify for Medicaid. 
um, but you also don't qualify for um, the Affordable Care Act subsidies. And so you have to pay full price for insurance, which is awful. Um, and so what often happens is people will kind of fudge their um, income and say that hypothetically they will start driving for Uber and make a whole bunch of money and that will push them at 138% of the poverty line. And so then they'll get subsidies or they'll underreport their income so they go down to 100% of the poverty line so that they can hit, um, so they can qualify for Medicaid. And so you can do income manipulation um, to be in or out of the program that doesn't actually you're not throwing away money or anything so it's not like regular manipulation it's just basically compliance you're saying i'm going to use this program even though i don't qualify for it or i'm not going to use this program even though i do qualify for it so when you have a situation like that then that messes up your discontinuity and you have this difference between a sharp discontinuity and fuzzy discontinuity so a sharp discontinuity looks like this. This is what we've been talking about throughout this whole session here, um, where the 70 cutoff here is a sharp discontinuity because nobody above 70 is using a tutor. Nobody below 70 is not using a tutor. Um, everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. Nobody's kind of crossing over into groups. And so you have sharp discontinuity. So if you're measuring a gap, you can do it just fine because you don't have people with people who scored high using tutors, people who scored low not using tutors. But you'll very rarely see sharp discontinuities in practice. Um, often you'll have something called a fuzzy discontinuity where you have imperfect compliance. So in this situation, you have people who scored low who didn't use a tutor, um, either because they opted not to or because they fell through the cracks or something. Um, you also have people who scored high who then went out and used a tutor anyway. Um, and so they did not comply with the treatment. Um, either they snuck in on tutoring sessions or they hired one of the tutors separately or something. Um, and so once you have this, measuring that gap is no longer super accurate because the whole intuition behind this gap is that these blue dots here, right on the yellow line, are basically the same as these dots. Um, the only difference is just kind of luck. Um, but if you have kind of these non-compliers here, suddenly your treatment and control group includes people who both got treatment and did not. And so that messes up your groups and it's really hard to have just clear causal inference from this situation because of the fuzzy discontinuity. There are ways of fixing this. Um, and we'll talk about this in the session after we talk about instrumental variables. The way you address this non-compliance is with something called an instrumental variable. And we'll talk about this later. You basically use an instrument that determines which side of the cutoff people should have been on and then calculate the size of the gap. Um, and it, it works. The only issue is the effect that you find is, is a local average treatment effect still, but it's also something called a doubly local effect. It's the effect of the program for people in that bandwidth who also complied. And so it's kind of an even hyper, an even more hyper-specific version of the causal effect, where you're not finding the causal effect for um, the whole population. You're finding it for people in the bandwidth, but you're also finding it basically for people who complied. So these blue dots here and these maroon dots there, you're ignoring these people, the non-compliers. And so whatever you find is going to kind of be um, limited just to people who follow the rules. Um, so you can't say anything about the non-compliers and you can't say anything about these people or these people. Um, so it's a more specific version of a treatment effect, but that's that's what you can do. So in a couple sessions, we will talk more specifically how to do about how to do fuzzy discontinuity um, analysis. There's packages for it. The RD robust function lets you do fuzzy stuff. So it's not from a technical standpoint, it's it's fairly easy. Um, but we have to talk about the intuition behind instrumental variables to be able to understand that. And that's what we're talking about next week. So head over to the example page and you can walk through an example of how to do regression discontinuity. Um, and we'll go back to this example here of our entrance exam and our exit exam and whether or not tutoring helps. And we'll measure this gap a ton of different ways. So go over there and let's get started.